Hi, and welcome to another Making Sense of It with me, Emma Kenny. I'm Peter Smith. And here we are to catch you up with yet another week in what can only be described the most exciting lives in the North. That's a lie, but we did do something relatively exciting this week. Who's got more exciting lives than us, like? Pretty much everybody, I know. In the North. Like, pretty much everybody. Yeah, everybody's... I'm sure I was, my brain was trying to think of someone famous from the North then, or somebody... Lisa Riley. She lived on this estate. That's a little fact for you. Lisa yeah. Riley lived on the estate that we now live on. Does she still live here? I think she might still have a house, but I think she's gone south because she's on these women all the time. She lost all that weight and thought, forget it, don't need pies anymore. Yeah. Off I go to the south. It's very famous. I thought it was Wigan. Famous for pies. Yeah, but we've got Greg's. Yeah. Lisa Stansfield. Lisa Stansfield from Rochdale, just well, down she, the road. Well, she's, she's, she was on radio, BBC Radio 2. The Neville there. brothers, Neville Neville, Gary Neville, and the other one. Ian Neville. What's his name? The other one, Gary Neville. Philip Neville. Philip Neville, yeah. Philip Phillips. Who my sister was friends and is friends with somebody who actually went out with him. And he dumped her just before meeting that, well, I say just before, you know, meeting the blonde, gorgeous one that he married. And she still works with her, my sister. So there you go. The stuff I know, you know, the stuff I know about private Mm. lives of footballers is scary. What do you think that their dad's dad and mum, mum and dad were thinking of when they called him Neville Neville? Just really like the name Neville. Why should the fact that we're called Neville dictate (laughs) that we can't use that name? Yeah. Easy to remember. Of course. Stands out. It does stand out. There you go. Yeah. I often think that with names, like what were the parents thinking? Mm, like uh, if I was called Peter Peterson. At the same time, somebody did say last week that they thought that my son's name Tide is ridiculous. But at the end of the day, screw you, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you yeah. nasty bastard. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and if you know, and you know you are, you troll. <laughs> you have to do your I, was own. Actually, I was actually looking up after we'd done that last podcast about what kind of stuff was going on with people who were trolls. I just kind of like, obviously, I do quite a lot of psychological work around that area. But I was like, I think is there a lot of research on the makeup of a troll? And they basically were saying that the thing about social media, as opposed to things like even Facebook, was less so than. Twitter, for example. But Facebook and Twitter are the two main reasons why people get nasty. And they're saying, like, you're miles less likely to get a text message that's nasty. But you'll often get things off people that would seem rational and normal, but have this insidious nature. And it kind of made me think, oh, you know what? That makes me feel really good because I have never in my entire life written a really nasty Twitter text to anybody. I think I've probably once said something negative about Katie Hopkins. But with respect, I just think that that means that I've got a good sense of self and I'm a nice person. Yeah, I don't think there's a lot of people out there who have said something nasty about Katie Hopkins. Yeah, (coughs) she loves it though. Of course she does. She's she's that's the things. character she is. I didn't even... Is she still doing stuff? I don't know. I've never I haven't seen her. I, don't I hope not. I hope she's no. a rock somewhere. Oh, shouldn't have said that. Ed Sheeran <laughs> apparently took a break for an entire year off social media because he said he would get up in the morning and the trolls were so negative towards him that he would literally read one and it would ruin his day. And that's why he took a massive break. Right. Is he back on it now? He's back on Twitter and everything now. But the point is, having that digital detox has completely transformed his experience. And he's just felt like Miles more present, Miles yeah. more mindful. He's felt more creative. And it does kind of make you start thinking about the stifled effects of being on social media a lot. I mean, I'm really lucky in the fact that I genuinely mean it when I say I love my Twitter family and my Facebook family. But when somebody crops up and pops up and has goes at you on your own page and tells you you're not professional because actually, you know what, you might have an opinion or you might be pissed off with something mm. you kind of think man it's, it's my page like <laughs> the whole point of it being on my page is yeah. that i'm me and this idea of the professional context like that you are a professional 24 7 like guess what i'm not professional 24 7 i'm a mum quite a lot of the time i'm a wife quite a lot of the time i'm a chef occasionally i'm definitely an animal carer i'm all of these different dynamics you know what i mean <laughs> animal care. Well, I've got that many of them. I've got yeah. one on my lap right now. Yeah, you have. I know, she's here, she's asleep. For those of you who can't see on YouTube or on the podcast, it's because she's very small and she's cuddled up on my lap. She's she gorgeous, is. though. She is. So what did we do last week? Let's talk about <clears throat> saying yes to life. Yeah, we did. What did we do last week? I've just, I'm sorry, I've just been working. I've been working quite a lot, <laughs> haven't we? Which we always do. But um, last week was amazing. Yeah, and it was. Yeah, so we went to... This is hilarious because Pete has genuinely, (laughs) in a few days, completely forgotten what we did last week. That's how much of a life presence he is. He's just like, new day, Uh, new day. Absolutely. Forget everything that's gone before, Uh, new day. New hour. (laughs) 
I've left the gas on. <laughs> Where you, am I? Yeah. Yes, that's what you did the other day. You walked in, you lit a joystick, and you walked out. And only about half an hour later, I'm like, what's that hissing? Oh, Pete's left the gas on, fine. Uh, see, new minute. <laughs> you know, new minute, new few seconds. What are we doing? Where am I? Uh, now we did, we, we did a few few things, didn't we? Yeah. So we, first of all, we drove down to Oxfordshire and did the... We've already spoken about that because the we did the podcast yeah, after that, yeah? That's right. And then we went to London. We did. We had an unusual three days in London where you and the boys came with me. Mm. So Pete and I were given the opportunity to go with Emma Sale, who's like an amazing woman. She owns Killing Kittens and she's the feminist ambassador behind the whole positive sex movement for women. And I've kind of started to get to know where we really connect. And she invited us to go to the opening of Proud on Embankment because Proud has moved from Covent Gardens and is now going to be at Embankment or one of them is going to be at Embankment. And we didn't realise, but it was actually a flappers kind of do, where you meant yeah. to wear fancy dress or at least accommodate that kind of art deco look. And um, Pete and I were insanely scared about the whole process because number one, we never go out at night, do we? We're really sad. We just not anymore. Like, we just like stay in and we cuddle our dogs and cats and play with the kids and just have like a quite a quiet life. And so we were told that we could go and it was VIP. And I'm never VIP. I'm VIP at the cinema when I pay for the seats. Yeah. That's it. So we kind of got ourselves ready, didn't we? We took the boys to the hotel. And that was something that really impressed me. You really impressed me that day. Because I usually do all the kill with kindness complaining to get what we need. But that day we arrived at that park plaza and it cost quite a lot of money. Mm. And we don't splash out. We were a travel lodge family. But this time we wanted to have three days where we really went for it and just enjoyed that kind of spoiling ourselves. It's been quite a hard few years. And we just wanted to just have a really nice, relaxing time. And we get there and I swear to you, they looked yep. at us they saw us coming like the rabble we are because obviously it's a four-star hotel and we look one star if we're lucky and we kind of stumble in don't we with like our backpacks and stuff where everyone else has got their lovely matching luggage and we're just like throwing bags around and they were like we're shoving these somewhere that nobody can see them and they put us in the conferencing area yeah. it was ridiculous and I didn't even bother did I just went Go and get us moved yeah, to the twelfth or thirteenth floor because that's where I usually I think it was stay. Like four rooms or something on the second floor oh, and under the conference awful. rooms. And it was just like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, we're not paying money. What uh, is it about people to... looking at you and thinking, yeah, they're not really going to be bothered if we put them in a terrible room because, like, they obviously. Because actually, they, were, they, were, they said that when we got there, and they said they were training people. So there was loads of like, new staff there, but it was actually people who just joined that were training them because on her badge, the lady who served us who was doing the training with the other guy. She was actually a new employee as well, so she'd just been trained. They didn't have a clue what they were doing, I don't think. No. That's uh, what I'm, try I'm trying to think of it like, in a positive it was way. It was incredible. So then, like, my boys, don't get me wrong, because we don't often go away to, like, nice hotels. And both of them were like, no, this is cool. It's really nice. Cause it was a nice hotel. So it was like, but the room reminded me of, like, an Ibis, which is great. I love the Ibis, but not when I'm paying the amount that we were paying that day. Yeah. So Pete trundles up anyway. You did it, didn't you? You did it. You got us moved up to the 12th floor where I wanted. And we walked in, didn't we? And the boys were just like, oh, my God. Because yeah. you get, like, your own sitting area you get your own bed you get a really nice bathroom Which, to be fair the money we pay oh my god yeah like you say the money if 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 we'd have paid sort of like travel lodge ibis you know they're sort of totally accepted yeah you know what i mean because they are when everyone nice. was kicking off yeah. at the Ro scott whatever it was royal scott yeah royal scott in london we were like oh it's fine it's yeah, fine it's like 30 quid a night it's yeah. amazing but when you're paying <laughs> a lot more than that way much you know for it's, yeah. it was a lot of money. Um, it's properly, that's properly what we should have been upset. given. That's what we should have been given. To be fair, so we the guy, the guy went down complaining. The guy was like, "Well, it is London." <laughs> I was I like, know. Oh, what "Yes, it is London, and that's why it's costing us the same for a week abroad, yeah. for three days, Mister." Yeah, and we have been very, very careful to come on this trip. That's been <laughs> saving. <laughs> and anyway, long story short, we get moved to this gorgeous room. And we were thrilled to pieces, and the boys had their own room. We got ourselves ready, didn't we? I had our headpiece and everything. I went properly for it, didn't I? I say I went properly for it. I didn't. What? Well, Oh, you rocked it. What actually happened, though, let's be honest, if we really tell the truth, what happened was I found out two days before that it was actually meant to be fancy dress. Didn't know that. Not fancy dress, but art deco cabaret style dress. Yeah, so I hadn't realized that. So I sent off, as you do, to Amazon Prime. They delivered what can only be described as something that my grandma would have made me. So that obviously wasn't going to work. But I got a headpiece that was all right. And then I just threw on a dress that I've had for 12 years oh, with a worked. pair of shiny shoes. And oh, it, you, it worked. You rocked it. Well, it just worked. 
worked. She rocked it. It was a very dark room. Anyway. I just had a suit. Like, you look you know, great. You know. The worst bit being that when you put your suit on, somebody thought that you were a member of staff. Yeah, at the hotel, yeah. And they asked you whether you could help them with the room. Yeah, I should have just not worn a tie. I didn't need to wear a tie. <laughs> you didn't need to wear a tie, actually, but well, you look great. I stood knocking on the door and, uh, to, to get into the boys' room <laughs> and the woman walked past and went, oh, excuse me, uh, can I get in my room? Can you please help me? Uh, and I said, I'm sorry, I don't work here. <laughs> Uh, just like wearing the uniform yeah, that's yeah. something I do I'm just I'm just management <laughs> you could have been really abused and been really screwed it up for them I know how dare you yeah. speak to me you're only on room 12 you look you're like a horse 12. go and tell everybody downstairs that I think all the people who work here are goons as well we hate you My all the staff go- yeah. hate yeah. you we're going to burn your belongings when you've gone out we're going <gasps> to leave dog poo under your pillow anyway so that's the kind of thing that happens not what Pete would do, but what Pete imagines he'd do if he was in power. So anyway, we go along. Imagine being running the country. No. Actually, yeah, I could. It'd Everybody nice, needs though. to have dog poo under the pillow and do bad things. <laughs> I don't even know what to respond to that. Um, anyway, so we go to Proud. We do. And it was one of the best nights of my life. Oh, God, we walked in and there was, there was people taking four photos there. Yeah. We did Which that. Which is weird because it was like you, you didn't know what to do. Yeah. Totally we got a up. taste of what it must be like to be like famous. Yeah. Because people were like going, can you look here? Can you look here? Can you look here? And we were just like trying to act like it was just normal and nonchalant. Yeah, yeah, of course yeah. we can. You know, really. No problem at all. I was trying to look shorter because obviously in heels I'm considerably taller than you because I'm tall anyway. And we <laughs> managed we doing that. to try to look like we were like, yeah, yeah, yeah it's completely okay. Yeah, yeah I'm yeah, used to this. We're used to this red carpet. Then thing. we went in and there was just like loads of celebs there. Yeah, well, there was, we went in and there was like <laughs> staff member after staff member after staff member give, taking it and they took us and a girl showed us to the table. And because Emma is Sale is a friend of the of oh, no. the owner. Um, and also she's a rocking face woman who's yeah, very, very, very popular. Yeah, yeah very popular. I love world. her. They took us to this table, which was... A booth. A booth, a but it was like, booth. it was the, the it, what can I describe as the actual... Yeah, the there's two area. tables that yeah. overlook like the main floor. And it was it's the two main booths that are like there. It was like yeah, if you're trying to think, I'm trying to think like in Scarface with yeah. Al Pacino, and it's like that club they go to in the booth and they it, sit there, you know, insane. overlooking the sort of floor over the cabaret, you know. It's like that sort of vibe, insane. wasn't it? And they it was sat us down, and then it just sort of unfolded from there. Yeah, like you're saying, the celebrities there. There was you're looking down. There's all these like people of EastEnders and various yeah. other celebrities, you know, and. Uh, Felt, I don't know, it was like the cricketer took, that took was in our, within oh, our booths. David Gower. David yeah. Gower was with us. David Gower was with us. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God, that was just insane. And so we sat there and we literally didn't know what to do with ourselves because this is not the kind of thing that we do or go to, is it? No, no. And there were all these amazing cabaret acts. If anybody is in London and you are listening to this, you've got to go to Proud because it is just absolutely it insane. It is mind blowing, yeah. It was wonderful. But then it gets better because we obviously have taken money with this illusion that that's what happens when you go out you have to buy drinks it turned out we had a designated waitress and she kept filling our glasses all night with the best champagne i've ever tasted then we were drinking 30 pound cosmopolitan cocktails which literally i would never have bought because it's over five pounds i'm definitely not gonna have it in fact if i'd gone there on my own I would genuinely never have bought a drink. And I've been like, can I have some tap water? I think it's a legal requirement that you give me tap water. water." (laughs) And that would have been the case. But it was absolutely incredible, wasn't it? I mean, they even, they just... The only other thing I I could have likened it to was in, it was um, a table service like in Pasha when you're in Ibiza, but you pay thousands and thousands for it, and then you only have so many limited drinks. But this place was just, the staff were absolutely... Wonderful. Oh, yeah, just the, the food. cabaret was incredible. They gave us food. We yeah, had a three course food. meal. It was absolutely phenomenal. You know, and I'm expecting where's the bill. And was even the guy who did a speech at the end before they sort of opened it into a club sort of type of affair and said, you know, um, you've all come and you've had it all for free because it's our opening. And, you know, and he did a great speech about London trying to stay as London. And Yeah, he was kind of saying that in London there's been like a real issue. So basically he was renting a place and leasing a place. He'd done it, made a massively successful business. The guy just goes, I'm selling it for development. So he lost his business. It's the Russian oligarchs. Was it it oligarchs? Is that how you say it? Oligarchs. So there's something about that in London though, isn't it? Like they're selling off the very soul of it. Yeah. But we had a blast, didn't we? We had an absolute blast. But all the night I was going, rich people get everything for free. 
It was insane. Like, we're not rich, so obviously we pay for everything. But we were kind of in that mindset where we were like, this is probably one of the most wonderful nights that we'll ever have. Literally didn't spend one pence. It was fantastic. And yet, for so many people, that's just normal, isn't it? But to yeah. us, it, I, we just kept looking at each other and go, for one night only, didn't we? We yeah. were like, for one night only, we get to pretend. For one night only, we get to live how the other half live. And uh, it is quite nice living that way. But funnily enough, we were watching. And again, this is just the thing. You always have to reframe everything, don't you? Me and Pete, in our life, and if you're listening to us now, and you will probably be very like us, to be honest, because obviously if you're listening to our podcast, it's probably because you relate to us. And you will have guessed by now, we are quite a way down the line with our podcast. So if you're listening to us and you've listened to many of them, you will feel probably like you know us a little bit and also probably that you understand we are the most normal people that you're ever going to meet. Uh-huh. And even though I might be on TV series and on television regularly and writing in national magazines and all of the nice glossy things that I seem to do, actually it doesn't make you a lot of money. And more importantly, it doesn't really mean that your life changes in any other way apart from more people criticize you and for P it's not necessarily something that he'd ordinarily have done if he hadn't been with me this podcast it's just more chatting about our day-to-day lives and one of the things like I said that you'll have drawn out from that is we just do not have any airs and graces we are the most normal people that you'll ever meet and that's what we love and to be honest we're grateful for everything and I think that that would be something we would lose because I was looking at the way that some people were treating the waitresses and waiters and these guys were amazing like I said you know what a service yeah the, I think that they were amazing and each 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 one had their own individual look about it but quite burlesque and quite mm. You know, even though they had like an outfit they all had to wear, they all wore it in different ways. Some had different bras with it were open, so it was more burlesque. Some were right up, some, you know, and they all just did, you know, they all had a smile on the face. But every time they came over, we were like, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And we were probably the only ones doing that. We were probably the only ones who were really acknowledging it because we felt really surprised and blessed that people were serving us with such kind of vigor Mm -hmm. and they were so nice and we enjoyed every minute of it. But I don't think we would have enjoyed it if that was our normal Mm, because it would just feel so normal and it was such a treat. And like I said, I don't think I'll ever see anything like that again in my life, but you know, I'm dead glad we got to do that. And that was saying yes. And I feel like that's been a major kind of shift for me. Absolutely. Um, I mean, I didn't know it was... Cabaret or burlesque, I just thought it was an opening of a bar or a restaurant, you know, and got there and for it to be like that. It is um, just from the out, it pulled up on the outside and it was just phenomenal. It's like all green and like. It felt like you come back like, in time. Yeah, I mean, you really did. It was like walking into a set on Scarface. Yeah. Or Miami. It felt like I was in Miami or somewhere, you know, somewhere like, not Las Vegas, more Miami ish. It was more, that had that vibe to it. I've never been to Miami, so I wouldn't know. Well, no, you know, the sort of the 1920s. No, I mean, I wouldn't know. It's not my kind of... I don't yeah, really the know Yeah, Scarface-y it. sort yeah. of... Just, I don't know, it was... It, Maybe it was because we were in London and on It was holiday awesome. And, and, and the weather then, was warm as well. Which yeah. Oh my God, the weather was warm. And then the next day we kind of went for a wander because we went on the ribeye experience. And again, this is just so irrelevant if you're living in a different country and listening to us. But like, say you ever get to go into London. I never get to do touristy things. I go to London. I get on a train home. That's it. Go to London, do my job, get on the train home. Never see anything. Never go anywhere. If I'm in a hotel, I'm usually in a hotel on my own. Don't necessarily even go out to eat. Just probably just stay in my room and just work. So that's my experience. In London, so whenever I bring the kids down and pee down, we always try to do some like really touristy things, like real touristy things. And we've done this before. It's called the Ribeye Thames Experience. It's basically a speedboat that takes you on a tour and then takes you all the way down the Thames, down to Greenwich. And it goes, it goes further. So it goes, good. it goes down to uh, the Thames Barrier. Well, you can pay for different ones, mm. and we pay for a seventy-five minute one. It takes you all the way down to the Thames Barrier. They get permission to go through it, and they come back round. It's amazing. It was absolutely. It's you get in and you. We take you up past the Houses of Parliament first, just did slow, and the, the guys are like, they're, they're, te- you know, they're quite sort of historical with it, and they tell you, and it's quite interesting if you're into that sort of thing, you know. Yeah, can, I just, say, not- can I just say, one of the most historical facts is the Women's Bridge in London. Um, the Women's Bridge was built by women in the war. It is the only bridge to have ever been delivered on time and to budget. Yeah. For any woman out there, you will have music playing in your ears at this point because there you go, out of all the bridges in the world, the only one that never got delivered on time and in budget was built by a pile of birds and it doesn't surprise me for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> That's true though, isn't it? I know, but we went on that and that was insanely good. Apart from, again, this is our optimism, isn't it, Pete? 
we were in the hotel in the morning and we went down for breakfast and it was just a busy, it's like a big hotel, lots of people there, went at a busy time. Yeah. Went a bit earlier the next day because we knew that we had to get off. But that particular morning, we get there, it's dead busy, we're on minutes and we're like, downstairs and one of the kids had forgotten their key hadn't they so they couldn't get the coat so we were just like it's cool we can just go without coats how mental was that just go without coats (laughs) on a really freezing cold boat in london at a speed on the thames but we bloody well did it we did it was amazing well we got there and they give you they give you the um thank god they give you a full full outfits uh uh, henry lloyd outfits yeah but if you've got a chance to do it go and do it it was was brilliant i mean when they open up the they open up the the boat and um, start cutting it up. I you know. You know, I feel like you're going to go in. Yeah, but it, they really pick up. Uh, is it a three, four knots, something like That's that? Insane. Really fast. I mean, like banging it off the waves, you know, um, with music playing and stuff. Listen to you with your nautical speech. Hey, you know. Talking in knots now. Oh, talking in knots, you know. <laughs> How fast are you walking? Three to five knots. Oh my God, that's a fast. That's, that's fast. Yeah, that's fast, that's no a, farrer. That's a sprint. You know, yeah. I think, don't quote me on that. Any nautical heads out there, sailors, tell me if I'm wrong, please, because I probably am. I'm making it up. I'm just saying words. But then, after that, we went and saw the National Gallery. We went to the National Gallery, and Pete nearly had a breakdown because we wandered in without any really kind of option of of thinking about it. It was just like, oh, we're in Trafalgar Square. There's the National Gallery. But we didn't see the front of it. You see, we came from the side, so there was no... You see, on the National Gallery, you realise there's big things on the front telling you what's on. And we came in the side like, oh, oh, should we go in there? It's free. Okay, then. And then just opened up and we were like, the boys are in there. And they were quite, I mean, what I liked was that our two boys were actually in there and they weren't just (gasps) bored, you know. Oh, no. They actually, 13 and 15, were really interested in the pictures. And I mean, I sort of, if you think about it, though, at that age, if you've not seen anything like that, because I don't think they have, they haven't seen, to see something that, opulent inside and, and wonderful and different and it's sort of more, it's not audible what's the word for you when you see it with your eyes it's like it's something that just makes it just yeah it like brings whole, it to life yeah it's like a whole new world to see that sort of art yeah it's like it? an aesthetic isn't it yeah like seeing and then, learning and feeling. so we're wandering around these rooms and that and they're getting lost and checking things out and just go wow look at this and look at that and we walked in this room and emma just nudged me and went have you seen what's there <laughs> and i looked and i was like that's that's sunflowers <laughs> by by Van Gogh, Van Gogh. and and we were like really, and then we sort of walked over, and it was literally, you see, what well, this it was about a foot away from you. you could literally reach in, you could have reached in and touched it. You'd have been kicked out if you'd have done that, obviously. Um, and then we started looking, and we realised the whole wall was all Van Gogh, and then we looked around us, and then there was Matisse, and then Picasso, and Mondrian. And, and it was Monet. just and Monet and it was just like Turner, Turner all of Sergeant them. Yeah. Renoir we came across so what we didn't realise is that they'd brought this whole collection and they'd borrowed a lot from collectors insane and they put them together and it was this I can only I mean I've been into I've been sort of an artist yeah so Pete started a fine art degree didn't you years yes. ago and art's always been your thing yeah so that that's and I've never even been, for me yeah but I've never been to a gallery. I've been to many galleries, lots of galleries, so many across the country. And I've never seen a collection put together like I saw that, that day of so many class A Just historical things that you see on postcards and yeah. like cards and books all the time. and stuff that you research yeah. when you're new and you, when you're in your the, calendar. History of art and stuff, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, you know, it's like, it just, it just it blew me away. I couldn't believe I was staring at the and literally inches away from these these paintings, which were on loan just and put together in one collection. Thirty-three million pounds worth. Yeah, that's just for the sunflowers. Wasn't yeah, thirty-three point nine million, something like that. And things probably I think worth that'd be more worth, that'd be now, worth fifty isn't it? million right now. But the last time my brother actually saw that was in Amsterdam. Yeah. So obviously it moves around, doesn't it? Yeah, that but to you be... You don't know a, when be, you're going to get that again. Especially in that, that level of, of, of artists together, you know. And I just wanted to go back and get the earphones and just kind of walk around and do that. Yeah. And it was just breathtaking. And it's also breathtaking to kind of go through a history of time. We're looking at art because I am artistically a five-year-old with webbed hands. That is my level of artistic talent. I am not one of those people that likes to play myself down and secretly at night I paint masterpieces. I cannot draw stick men. Can't draw stick men. They're all wrong when I try. I have no talent. My talent in art is actually worse than my talent in maths. And 
everybody knows that my talent in maths is pretty atrocious. Yeah, my talent in maths is worse than yours. But at least you're brilliant at art. Like, you will just, like, sketch something. You'll be like, oh, no, just try that. And it's like, oh, my God, it's so good. Or, like, you'll do an art project with Evan, who's quite good at art. Our youngest son is good at art. And it's just breathtakingly amazing. And, like, they always win prizes and stuff. And I'm so bad. But for me, to kind of be in front of Van Gogh, who to all intents and purposes, is not a great painter when it comes down to drawing or painting masterpieces. For example, when you see, you know, the, the Feast of Jesus on the, mm. the Last Supper, where the faces look like they're absolutely there and alive. And you, Van Gogh could never have done that right. But what he captures is something different. Yeah. It's like he transmutes his feelings into a picture a painting mm -hmm. and you kind of get a sense of who he is within it and that's yeah. why I think that art's meant to be provocative and whilst I'm terrible regarding art and my understanding of it I know what reaches me and it's a bit like we collect um, Erin Hammond's art and for many people collecting art sounds like you can afford a lot of things because when you say I collect a particular artist it sounds like you're obviously wealthy well Erin's actually somebody that I met in Guyana when I was doing a relationship show she was one of the people who was having problems in her then relationship mm -hmm. so I spent a week intensely with her doing therapy and she's just like one of the most amazing amazing women and at the time I didn't really know that she was an artist you know it didn't really come across she was an actress actually so I didn't really talk to her about her art you know we mentioned it and then a few days before we went home because we were literally in the jungle we were in the rainforest basically that was what we were doing I was living in the rainforest with them which was just insane an insane catcher falls and stuff like literally sitting in front of one of the biggest you know biggest waterfalls in the yeah. world and just feeling that power and just living in the actual jungle it was brilliant but she was one of these people on the journey on and then she handed me a couple of days before I went home this little kind of sketch and it was a sketch of what I would consider like almost like we're talking about like pre-Raphaelite type look of women and I was like, this is amazing anyway it turned out that she's a real artist and like an amazing artist so we now collect her pieces we have one two three four five because there's two coming over yeah. but she does them incredibly cheap because I'm her friend and we agree not to sell them for commercial products but if you've ever seen on any of my kind of YouTube channels or on my Facebook there'll be pictures that you'll see and it's her art in the background or if you've seen this podcast sometimes from a different angle her art's hanging on my wall and the reason that I love it is it speaks to me no, it's brilliant. it speaks to me but yeah. I'm not somebody who has an understanding of art all I know is how does it provoke my feeling yeah I mean Erin's Erin's art is 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 something that I'll I think will gradually start going for a lot of money well she's she, just you know, one art battle yeah she's insane yeah, I guess she wouldn't. Yeah, she? yeah, wow. she's absolutely insanely good. Yeah, but it's more that that isn't about the art being worth money to us because I would never sell yeah. it. No, no, it's, I'm sat, sat looking at it now. The big piece we've got, and it's absolutely. I mean, go online, check out her stuff. It is, it is, it's very thought provoking mm. and it's very emotional, and it, the, the colours differ from it's one amazing. to the next. But it is a, she's a phenomenal. And artist. you see the transition of her experiences, oh, yeah, you, see, you know, exposed in her art. Yeah, you see. Uh, uh, Obviously, it's a life journey that's happening mm. there and, and how it translates into the way she's painting, you know. But, I know. You know, you'll see in a studio. Her brother's a good singer as well. Oh, he's amazing. Yeah. What was that song that he sang? Kevin Hammond. Is that his name? Kevin Hammond, Kevin Hammond. Yeah. He's a really famous gospel singer. He's a really famous um, Bible kind of... Yeah, yeah. But he sang, he sang, he did an acoustic version of... S Chandelier by Chandelier Sia. Chandelier by Sia, yeah. Check that out as well. Yeah, that, maybe put it in a mind. link. Put it in a link at the bottom so people can check it out. I will, yeah. I'll put, I'll put both of them. I'll put them in the mm, link first. Because he's yeah. absolutely awesome. They're obviously a talented family. <laughs> I know. It's so sad. I've got no talent at all. My brother and sister are insanely talented at very much either. We're just like kind of normal people. But art is a really strange one because the only other time that I've ever been moved where it made me take action. My grandma had died. My my grandma who was you never knew you know you knew yeah. my other gran and I was quite lucky actually my grandma my, el my eldest gran lived till 95 nearly so Pete got to know her before she died but my grandma Taylor who is my dad's mum she lived till 84 so it was still a good innings kind of thing but when she died she had literally no money really my grandma Taylor was one of those people who never talked about how 
little she had. Yeah. My dad would always treat her like she'd go away somewhere with my aunt Shona and then he'd do the house up. And it was always one of those, but she never confided in us that she was struggling financially. And then when she got a terminal illness, my mum managed to get benefits for her. And she would say towards the end of her days how ironic it was that she'd never had as much money in her life as in her terminal illness and towards her death. And in doing so, she managed to put away a thousand pounds and it was shared between my sister, my brother and myself and my two cousins. So there was 200 pounds each. And I remember thinking, what will I spend this money on? And my sister was putting it towards jewellery and I just thought, I don't want to put something towards it. I want it to be a memento of my grandma that she paid for. Not that there's anything wrong with doing that, but it just felt yeah. really important to me that I had something that was wholly from her. And I went to France with my mum and dad and we went in this gorgeous tea room in northern France and we'd been walking around these cobbled streets and I walked in and I just looked to my right and there was this picture and it was just haunting. It was on wood, it was large and I looked at the French price for it because it wasn't the euro at the time and it was enough for me to buy it with my grand's money and so I paid for it there and then and they went and got the artist who lived in one of the houses above and he came and he was just like talking to me because I at the time spoke better French than I do now because I'd been living there for a while and he brought it me and we took it that day and it's hilarious because we were in France there was me my ex-husband before we were even together we were just there as friends my mum and my dad and we'd driven to France and we were in, like, I don't know, a Cavalier or a Sierra. A Cavalier? And Vauxhall. Genuinely, this piece of art was so big that all the way home, now you can imagine if you've driven from the UK down to Calais, across to France, and then another four or five hours to where we were going, we had to do that. But we had to do it with this massive piece of art over all our heads. It, it was over all our heads. I thought Wales was a long way. It was such a long journey. But you know what? That piece hangs now in my brother's house because at the time, our other house didn't fit that context. Funnily enough, it does here, but yeah. I can't take it off him because he loves it and it's in a particular pride of praise. But it will never go. That will always be there for generations to come as long as my kids and their kids yeah. keep it because it's just so important to me. Yeah. You know, I have to make sure that we tell our children that then. Yeah. Yeah. I always think it's funny that my Uncle Derek's put in his will, the fact that we all inherit the cottage, the family, a holiday cottage in the Lake District that when we didn't have any money as kids, my uncle Derek's gay. And because he's gay, he's never had children. Not that that should stand in anybody's way, but it's of a time where that necessarily wasn't that probable for people. So he has just invested in us, basically. You know, we will get what he has at the end of his life. Thank you very much, Uncle Derek. Love (laughs) you very much. But... This cottage in the lakes is like this tiny little cottage and it's got like an open fire and it's where all my childhood memories and holidays were because we genuinely, when I say it, we did not go on holiday apart from there and it was just fantastic. It was the same holiday every year, repeated every year, but we are creatures of habit. It was great. And when it goes, he's put in the world that we must keep it so we always have a holiday because he thinks, you know, one day we could return to how it used to be when we didn't have any money. Yeah. But I'm like, I'm not sure, Uncle Derry, you can dictate by law that we have to keep the home. But I mean, I would like to. But yeah. again, it's that sense, isn't it, of just keeping things in the family. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. Um, you know, I've I've got stuff from my grandparents. which You've got a biscuit tin because you I've think got a biscuit it still tin, smells of And them. I'll tell you what, you open it now and it still smells because it's one of those biscuit tins that when you can shake it. I remember it, them. You know, and keep it's them the fresh. top shake, yeah. yeah. But because of that, it's only been opened a few times, but when you open it, it smells of them. You know, certain brothers have got like the creosote. Creosote smell always reminds me of my grandparents. Yes. You know, that really di- deep, dark, the, not, not the water-based stuff, the new stuff, the real old, like, you know... Kill insect stuff, you know. I, I remember that, my granddad had shed like yeah, that. I, mean, I can still remember the smell of my grandma's pantry. Right, gosh, yeah. Pantries. What pantry. happened to pantries? No, let's have a pantry. We should. We need a pantry. So whatever my grandma would 
make for us, particularly referencing a trifle. Like Christmas, she would always do like this trifle. It was delicious. It was absolutely delicious. Nobody makes trifle like my grandma did. And it, yet it would always have this strange taste attached. It wasn't unpleasant, but it was specific to my grandma's house. <laughs> and everybody, it just became eau de gran. And now I know I'll never, ever taste eau de gran again. Yeah. But there was something so resonant and memorable about those moments. And what you're saying about the sensory experience of just connecting a nostalgic memory to a moment because of a scent. Yeah. Because yeah, I, I lost too. my sense of smell for 12 oh, years. I mean, I could almost go and I'd almost say, and that sounds funny, a bit weird, a bit out there, but I'd almost say that there was always a certain taste of the 70s and 80s. There was. There was a taste to there it. Was. You know, like it was, I don't know if it was a young kid growing up taste, but the sort of, the smells, the, definitely a taste to it. The, and I look back on the photos, I see photos. I mean, God, the, da- the days where it was, you know, you don't have the phones and stuff like we do now. And I mean, I can't believe we're actually sat here, you know, doing this it's like as if like you're in a radio station you know and this sort of stuff but I mean the, looking at photos and you have little stickers on when it was in overexposed every single one of mine but you look at the colours and the clothes and obviously it is nostalgia and it is the fashion of the time so everything was brown but like yes <laughs> oh, and with orange in it you know but I can taste it I can smell it I it can was, taste it was also the time when you'd walk into your friend's house and everybody's house had a smell yeah. Every uh, single house. Whereas nowadays, like I walk into a house, like my sister's, it's just delicious. She has every air freshener and yeah. infuser. And I walk in, it smells of sweets, but it's not specifically her. You know what I used to get? I used to get, I used to go around people's houses whose, whose parents both worked and they were a bit more well off than most of the other friends that I had. And it sm- and, I, and the smell, I tell you now, the smell was either, was either polish you know, like proper polish, you know, used to use polish. Or the cooking used to be like some sort of meat, like a Sunday dinner with Yorkshire puddings mixed in with the polish. Mm. And then I'd have friends that were a sort of more on the poverty line who would say were living in a council house and it'd be fried food and cigarettes. Oh my God, <laughs> you know? cigarettes. And oh, not, I'm not saying about council houses, by the way. I just mean that some of my, my friends' houses smell of dog and cigarettes yeah, together. Yeah. That was the thing. and Sugar few... puffs always get to me. I used to call for someone in the morning. I'd go in and he'd be just finishing sugar puffs. I could smell yeah, the sugar I puffs in the house. I can smell and taste sugar puffs when you say it. Yeah. It's so weird because people don't really get, I think, how important smell is till you lose it. So I lost my sense of self and smell for 12 years. And people are like, what do you mean you lost it? Like we used to, no, I, like, I literally had no smell for 12 years. Um, I've had operations and now I do smell. It's not powerful like you experience, but to me it's just beautiful because I genuinely didn't have have it but when I stopped being able to smell I realized that for a start everything's black and white Mm. like there is nothing but black and white in food you can just basically taste sugar you can taste bitter you can taste acid you can taste bad but you can't define it there is nothing tangible about your memories that you can connect because there's nothing around you to connect you to that and even things like you know I'd go outside in the summer and I'd know that the grass had been cut but there was just nothing there it was like walking around in glass it was the weirdest thing and then they started to give me steroids six weeks of steroids because it would bring my smell back and I could choose the times of year that it would reduce the inflammation enough to do that and I would choose Christmas and I would choose summer yeah. And on both of those occasions, it would begin and it would always begin the same. And it was funny because I ran six miles a day and I would always do the same route at the old house. And it would be up past the Bol Holt Hotel. And the Bol Holt Hotel obviously does laundry and it uses a specific type of laundry. And obviously, when you're running every day, because you're running as well and you're taking quite a lot of air, as the steroids start to shift the inflammation and the smell starts to come back, I would be hit with this smell. And oh, There were no bad smells either. And I know that sounds really ridiculous. I've said that to you before. When you have lost your sense of smell, right, and you get it back, shit smells amazing. Oh, God. I know, I don't care. Because people might think of it. most pungent of crap smells. Because it's there. And it's like the most... People say, you know what, blind people, if they were told what a state the world was in some ways, you know, like if it was a terrible place, like war, would you choose to see? Yes, damn right, you choose to see. You choose to have your senses. Mm. They're hardwired and human, you know? Yeah. It's insane what that lack of connection does. So like you were saying, nostalgia and smell is like so important. It's your life's blood. It is, especially sort of 
for us before the sort of the the dawn of social media and mm. handheld computers and you know phones which mm. can do everything you know it was you know the, the childhood smell of something teenagehood yeah. smell of something I mean, it's all different it must be it must be it is we see it, it is all different now for young people growing know. up you know they, they don't have that way they've got a it's a different we look at it as different you know kids don't Every know kids does don't that. know any different they just it's like somebody who was born in the who was brought up in the sort of 30s and 40s you know they'll look at us and, and they don't know any different to what we know when we you know, they don't know. So we, it was gramophones then, and it became record players, and in the seventies and eighties, techniques were made, and you know what I mean. The natural evolution of time and the desire to see everything as better in the past, but you can't help but see that things are better in the past because you were a kid, yeah. and if you had a nice childhood, it's going to be better because you had no responsibility and your days were filled just going and playing out and yeah. having fun with your mates. So to some degree, you can't help but have that nostalgia. Actually, in studies of nostalgia, they say that two out of three memories that you're nostalgic about make you feel good so if you want to make yourself feel happy just looking at old pictures of yourself and yeah. kind of being nostalgic about those moments and connecting with that makes you just feel happy but recently obviously because I'm now like just over halfway through my existential crisis I it was still, halfway through last week, wasn't no, it? No, just so over you, halfway through. Just over it's not going as fast as I imagine. There's been some setbacks this week and there's been some progressions this week. Right. But in just, my progression I recognize that one of the problems with my reflections have been I've been concentrating on things that I feel a sense of loss over as opposed to feeling grateful for the experiences of having had it, if that makes sense. Yeah, I get you. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's um, it's a funny one, isn't it? When you can, you can sort of try and rewire your brain to think on a more positive note rather than get lost in sort of darkness of, you know... Because everybody's mm. got two sides, you know. It's light and dark, you know. You can, you can, you can walk around and and just constantly think the bad thoughts or mm. delve into the deep. It's I think it's that whole sort of devil on one shoulder, angel on the other type of affair, isn't it? Obviously not going, you go and do this, you know, no, do this, not that, but just more of a try and steer away from the dark thoughts and from things that don't really sort of make you feel good in your head. You know what I mean? You can reminisce and. Isn't it weird, though, the fact that you've got that choice between dark behaviour and light behaviour, and a lot of times it's just easier to go for the dark behaviour? Yeah. We were talking about this because I had this mental dream this week. I won't go into the absolute fundamentals of it. It's a bit too convoluted. And <laughs> as my brother says, makes him go to his safe place when I talk about it. But basically, I had the most intense dream I've ever had this week. And I woke up with what can only be described as a sense of utter euphoria and contentment. And I felt like in this dream, it wasn't scenery. There weren't people there. It wasn't about the normality of my dreams where you kind of just are going through various things and you might find yourself in a situation where, you know, you're dreaming of the past or people or new situations or you're running away from something that's chasing you in the dark, possibly with a hammer and an axe. It wasn't any of those. It was a dream of knowing. And I know in transcendental psychology, dreams are really, really important. Obviously, Jung, Freud, all of those great analysts, they themselves have their own ideas about it. And I suppose I always, with Jung, kind of looked at how he analyzed things from the perspective that you play everything in your dream. You know, if you're being mm. chased by a psychotic murderer, you're playing that part, which potentially means that you feel really stressed and things are going to get you. And, you know, you process it that way in kind of like a commonsensical type way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this dream just didn't it fit any of those parameters it was so strange basically for anybody listening if you've ever had a dream like this I would absolutely love you to comment and share because I don't know whether I'm just kind of going through some weird changes like I said I'm a certain age in a certain place in my life I'm seeking to kind of grow and develop as a person and maybe that's it but basically I was in my dream there was nothing but me and this ultimate sense of knowing. I knew everything that had ever been. I knew everything that would ever be. And it was all almost circular. It just all existed always. And I was reassured in this dream that every moment, every 
blink of an eye in this experience of life is just about energy and energy shifts and that nothing in this world really has any great meaning aside from what we choose to make it because there is a far bigger dimension and we're surrounded by all these different dimensions both of light and dark and if you choose the light dimensions you automatically bring energies into your life that are positive and light bearing and beautiful and enhance your life but there is a potential for you to also ruminate on the more easier to achieve dark things so drugs and sex that might be not positive for you and being around people who are negative towards you and bad relationships and all of this like that it's there and you can choose that but actually even though it's a bit more difficult if you choose the higher kind of dimension and feeling of that connection you invite into your life all of this beauty and I was like being told all of this stuff and informed of it but without any words any images just knowledge and I fell in the dream and this is what I said to Pete and it's so Mm. weird I thought in the dream I was dying I thought I was dying I literally was had a conscious thought which is this is it I'm dying this is where I'm going this is my journey and I was kind of completely content and I was a kind of thought came into my mind during it I absolutely sound mental now by the way I know <laughs> you anybody, don't sound mental. anybody listening to me right now you will be going she's 100% in the breakdown scenario but it was a sense crossed my mind it was like what about your children and I was just so content because I knew it didn't matter because this life is yeah. just negligible in the scheme of what we belong to and connect with this life is irrelevant and that's not to say that people in this life are irrelevant you know and we are all doing this we're all living our lives and obviously if you've lost children of course it's relevant i get all of that but what i'm saying is in the dream Mm. it made perfect sense and i woke up and i kid you not guys i kid you not since i had that dream i have completely changed my perspective on so many things like so i'm on painkillers for my back It's a prolapse disc, which is really bad. And they've said there's nothing they can do about it. I've just got to kind of deal with it. And I've completely refused to do that, haven't I? I'm Mm -hmm. like, no, I'm going to get down. I'm on one painkiller, not eight painkillers a day. I'm exercising, doing core and and making myself do plank. And I'm going to continue doing that. We've changed our diet. And I know it sounds ridiculous, but there was also this kind of thing, because obviously anybody who listens to me, sorry, I'm talking a lot today. Pete's not getting a look in. I'm I'm, I'm at all because I know I've (laughs) I've, I've spoken to you about this this whole sort of dream that you had and it follows on from the dreams that I've been having lately. You know, there's very sort of interdimensional sort of journeys into places which I felt like it was it was like as if you're being told so i mean i've been researching little bits on the internet and stuff the world of the internet is phenomenal sometimes and you come across some shite but you also come across some really interesting stuff and i was finding that sort of the energy shifts there has been some energy shifts i don't know what you want to call i mean within whatever it's so not so much solar flares but we're all made of energy and it shifted from dark to light or whatever. There's different theories out there and people saying different things all over the internet. Have a look at it. 2018. I haven't seen that stuff. Yeah, there's a, there is some sort of, from January onwards has been, mm. so and that's, I don't know. That's, uh, if you, this, this. That's synergetic though. Yeah, I know, you know. Uh, but yeah. Oh, sorry, carry on. No, I, I, no, I mean, I'm just saying like, I am just going on with myself a lot. I don't know, and I apologize. And it's one of those real weird ones because it's just really, really well, present. It is, it is making sense of it and it is a podcast mm, call. So I, mean, I know, but I just feel like I'm listening to my own voice and going on. But anyway, what I'm trying to say <laughs> is, that was all happening and I've grown up in that week to kind of say to myself like oh just have that agency that I always talk about you know just start making those changes but also there was this thing where it felt very sexual my dream and I woke up with this sense of when I fantasize sexually I have certain go-to fantasies. A lot of people have certain go-to fantasies in sex. I think most people do when they're sort of... Mm. And I would say that mine are quite dark. You know, I have quite dark kind of um, submission, domination, and I've never done anything but thought that was perfectly all right. I do think that's perfectly all right. Please don't think if you've got the same kind of fantasies that that's wrong. I'm not saying that. But what I started to think was, like, what if, when you're having those fantasies, you're inviting like dark energy into your world. Yeah. But if you try instead to fixate on something positive and beautiful, then maybe you're bringing something light into your world. So when we had sex the other day, I decided that I would have an orgasm thinking of that 
that positive, light filled, beautiful yeah. experience. Quite tantric. And it was so, that's, that's so the, much better. Yeah. And I don't even care whether that's to do with the fact that I'm articulating and giving myself permission because it feels that. But I'd never thought I would be able to have an orgasm yeah. thinking about that stuff. And it wasn't about images. It wasn't about fantasies. All I concentrated on was the feeling that I felt the other night. Yeah. So I wonder, I wonder if that's, this is the, uh, the sort of stuff where people are the tantric, the sort of energy shift. Tantric the, is all about yeah, that. You know, and, and, and building up and And holding it. orgasms for yeah. a really long time. Yeah, I think if you can... We're looking at doing tantra now, aren't yeah, we? Yeah, like sting. But I think I can understand now why... I uh, mean, I'm not going to do the 13-hour sex sessions. It would be exhausting. I've got a life. We haven't got time. But I'd like, no, I don't <laughs> No, but what I'm saying is, is you can see that when certain people... I don't know, is it an age sting or is it... Not so much enlightenment. I mean, we are going quite deep on this podcast, but we are trying to make sense of it. So like, that's the whole point of what it's called. But I wonder if that's, you get to a certain point, a certain level of, of humankind, of human being, of yourself being yourself and being alive. And you realize, you know, that whole, not so much like we read about there being a supercomputer and without a manual, but you start to learn things about yourself, about your body, about what you can open, how your different chakras, you know, that's why I put getting to yoga and try and concentrate on that, meditation, mindfulness, wellness, being, you know, it's it, it's sort of you being in control of what you are and being able to manifest your feelings mm. inside yourself and control that, you know, is is is... It's, I wonder if it is something of a certain age. I'm just sort well, of... Well, just that, that feeling at the moment that, like, in this world, there is so much discontentment and there is so much dysfunction and there's so much violence and a lot of it is around sexual dysfunction. You know, a lot of it is around hostility towards mm. women. A lot of it involves rape. A lot of it involves degradation of society, kids being murdered, you know, kids being bombed, all of these things, right? And I'm like, just, like, take a step back, back for a minute and why, the, why... Like, literally, you, think it's, you, you know, think like, tired. My eldest son came home yesterday and he sat down. Oh, no, it was a few days ago. He was doing his RE homework and, like, we really work hard on his RE homework. I think RE at school is really misjudged. I think it's a political um, argument a lot of the time. And I think it's really, really good for kids to learn. He's doing, like, Islam versus, like, Christianity, similarities, just, you know, all of the kind yeah. of things going on. And I love it because it really makes him to critically think, you know, because like religion has been there for a very long time. There's politics in it. There's feminism in it. There's misogyny in it. There's death in it. There's all of these different things. But it always has an applied concept within your own thought. What do you think? And he was kind of talking about, he went, you know what, mum? He said, there are 10 people in this world who have more wealth than the entire world put together. Mm. And he said... Every single one of those people could give a hundred thousand pounds away to every person in the world, and they'd still be rich. That's just and and it went and it made me just go, "What is going on?" That are they all male? I don't know. What I know is, could you imagine? They have got enough money. That person, those people, that That's one person has got that. enough money to live a billion, billion lifetimes, essentially. Like billions of lifetimes themselves and be rich. Why are they holding on to this? You know, imagine the way the world would change if everybody didn't have to struggle for food and didn't have to ruminate that they hadn't got enough. And what is this kind of capitalist cycle mm. where you're obsessed a lot of the time with feeling like you have to have this and you have to have that, but you can't do that. And he was saying as well, you know what, mum? The thing about charity is when people say that they can't afford it, but then like they buy a coffee for themselves. And I'm like, you know my ruling on that. Like I mm. just think give money when people are on the streets, whoever they are, just give them a sandwich or give them some cash because you shouldn't then think, well, I'm not going to do that because they might go and buy drugs. So what? Mm. So what? You know what? Your free will of giving, that is still a gift. If they go and choose to spend it on drugs because their life is so difficult, they need to escape or they have an addiction that they need to fulfill, then that's their choice. But your gift is still a gift. And we kind of say to ourselves all these excuses. Even the other day when that guide dog person came and I can't afford what she wanted me to give because I give to other charities and you give to other charities and literally we can't afford it. Yeah. But she was like saying, could I give it? I was like, no, I can't. I can give you this much. And in the end, she got this special sheet out where they could do less. And I was like, you know, because actually every kid under 16 who is blind should have a bloody dog. You know, they yeah. should have it. But I'm just kind of sitting there and I'm like, oh my God, 
It's so obvious. So what is it that is stopping us? And it's so clever if you think about the political powers to make us all feel really angry with each other. Yeah. It's Contro- so it's, it's, it's a good form, to control yeah, us. It's a form of control. If you we know. can make each other despise that community or blame that yeah. community or say that that person in that country is doing it wrong and we're doing it right, all we do is displace what could create change. And I'm at that stage where that dream, no matter how transcendental, if you're into transcendental psychology, you'll totally get how sometimes you can have kind of these shifts in energy in yourself and you can change your dreams, can make you change and alter the way that you live. And certainly that's where I am at at the moment. But it's kind of coming with this heavy heart of knowledge that what are we doing? Like, I know last week we talked about trolls, but what the fuck are you doing? (laughs) You absolute lunatics. You've taken time. You've taken precious moments from your being to spread negativity mm. how did that help your life your day how does anybody doing that it just mean it's, it's weird isn't it it's it's when you look at it in that sort of small context you think you, you yeah. whittle it right down to the bones of it and it's just like what what you know, Why? you know what? Way, what are you getting out of that? Because you don't like the look of someone, or you don't like the way someone's voice sounds. I'm a you sucker for it. When I was like a, when I was a kid, I was, you know, I haven't been perfect, and I'd be like, oh, I don't like the way they look. I don't like, you know. And I think it's just the people I've met from you to my children to the people around us and the way the world is and how things are happening. I don't know what's going on. I have mean, an existential crisis, like mm. you say, you know, but in a good way. Yeah, it makes you start realizing that. There is a lot more to what we call life and, you know, being negative and the dark thoughts, like going back to that is... Just is, be kind. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's just one step. Just yeah. try it. Try just that. Don't and don't be nasty. Yeah. I mean, I still get angry, you know, over silly things and I people know, do me head in, you know what I mean? But I might do people's... But I won't go and knock on the door and leave a note for them, which in essence is what's going on on, on Twitter. You know what I mean? I'm just going to leave a note for your ears saying how much of a dickhead you are. Yeah. You know what I mean? But but that whole thing, that just that thing, you then expose yourself to that like 150 yeah. times a day. Dark thoughts. And then you're like, oh, right now I'm going to be really angry with that. And you have this sense, like, don't get me wrong, I am totally imperfect. And occasionally I crack and say things and do things that I'm regretful yeah. of. But... For the most part, I do practice kindness. I do practice oh, gratitude. Do. I really, really do. And I do believe inherently that 99% of people are good human beings. It's just that for some reason, we're getting covered in all of this crap that people just project and that we don't really need to inhale, but we're just stuck. And I'm kind of frustrated because that's what goes back to when you and I regularly mm. be like, let's just go off grid. Let's just go off grid and have a life elsewhere. What we're actually saying is let's get away from what we know sucks the life out of you and makes yeah. you feel so disconnected. Like, when I am with good people, and I don't mean friends, I just mean like, you know, you'll go to the shop. You can and feel them You'll more. have that kind of conversation with a stranger and you'll just be like, um, thank you. We always used to say, as we were growing up, whether we were out partying or whatever, that the same type of good people will eventually always bump into each other and whether that relationship carries on as that or not you know what I mean you will always remember them and say I remember him he was a really nice person but it's like you can almost feel them and I don't know whether that's you know in psychology I don't think there's really much research on that sort of thing is there of like you know um, people feeling someone's goodness next to them you it's know empathy. but i, I think empathy, you can though. i think is a way of feeling someone who's just on the same level as you there's actually a lot of research into that kind of psychicity in psychology there's a lot of research in the secret services around that telepathy and yeah. that experiencing of being able to be a natural empathogen because obviously that's really really helpful for understanding and interpreting both liars and people telling the truth for example yeah but for me there is just this hostility in the world at the moment and it just kind of makes me so sad because i just know we've got everything that we could possibly need to make things better and now and obviously with the the progression of the digital age and ai and various things like that if they use it right you know alongside humans um Mm. you know it's like it's like people saying the stuff like the you know i used to eat meat don't anymore we've talked about in the past podcasts and i it's it's the the, and it's it's people stating now that 
more and more millennials, younger people, are turning to the vegetarian diet. Yeah, they get called know. snowflakes, but actually what they are are people who are becoming liberal and yeah, conscious. That, 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 that snowflake shit does my head in. That's just like, what the... Although about, at the same know, time, one thing I would want to say, as much as I literally hate war, I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. I do think that the way that we're treating veterans at the moment, people who, whether we agree with war or otherwise, are out there yeah. dying for us, dying, whether we have political conviction around that, whether we find war disgraceful. These boys and girls who risk their lives for us are coming back to the country and being treated so badly, yeah. being made to feel like they've done a terrible injustice. But you know what? The truth is they are not in a position of choice. They are doing a job because they believe in the patriotism and the people I'm sorry, in the UK. But if, it wasn't for, if it wasn't for these boys and girls, these men and women from the And I'm a pacifist. Well, yeah. That you know we would we we wouldn't be able to be sat here. Uh, not necessarily sat here, but talking the way we are, talking absolutely. the way we are. I'll tell you that now. And what gets my back up is is you know is trying to change the past. That's yeah, what gets my back up yeah, when they're trying yeah. to get Napoleon's. Th- Look, Churchill, bit of a racist dickhead a lot of the time. Did he do well in the war for us? Yeah, he did. Are we now emancipated from what would have been Nazi rule? Yes, we are. We can all go back and see how horrifically Africans and Indians and lots of people have been treated. Terrible. The colonialism was appalling. Mm. However, what was built from that, to some degree, has led to this situation now. And you can't turn back the hands of time or apologize to some degree in the present for that. All you can do is say, let's never do that again. Let's do all we can to maintain equality and I speak from a white privileged perspective I know that but at the same time I think that what's amazing about like you're saying about the millennial generation and the centennial generation is they are awakened in a different way I genuinely think there's a sense of awakening and isn't it funny that you're getting that awakening just at a time where social media is the most pernicious and aggressive and insidious it's almost like right well how do we control this generation who seem to be more liberal who seem to not want to go and kill people who seem to want equality and seem to want to say that it's okay if you have that belief system and you have that belief system let's find harmony right now let's make them feel terrible by flooding them with pictures of what they're meant to be like, yeah. with lives that they'll never experience, with a rhetoric that suggests division is the right way forward. If we can encourage them to just stay fixated on the problems, not the solutions, then maybe we'll erase that mindset. Well, but it won't. Yeah. It won't. No, you let's can't hope, do let's, that. Let's, let's hope that it's... Um, and for not to let's hope, I, I, I think we already know. I think there's a, I think there's a new dawn coming mm. of... Of, it um, has to because we are going to kill the human race otherwise yeah. there is no option yeah. you know people like trump for example these ancient dinosaurs of ridicule when you look back i mean he will be ridiculed as the worst president in the united states and there were some really bad ones yeah. at the end of the day that is a new dawn because what's happened there is yes it looks terrible to all intents and purposes but it's teaching us a very very serious lesson in that lesson is don't ever let yeah. that happen again yeah. You know? It's, you know, it's it's the opposite of the calm before the storm. It's you know, it's got to get into, um, you know, lunacy, and you know, it's got to. It's like when people say you hit rock bottom for the only way is up. You know, it's like the the world at the moment is. I wouldn't say it's on the precipice of nuclear war because that's. I think that's that's going back to the sort of you know. When oh, the, the megalomaniacs you know, are far too yeah. far too arrogant to yeah, kill themselves. You know, There's think, no way they'll I, do I that. I do think that it's you know the people. It's 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 chaotic the chaos comes before you calm know, yeah. always and chaos creates growth but there is also when you look back through time you can actually see that the the right the far right for example that happens and then the liberals come back in that happens and then people go oh wait a minute that's too liberal then it goes back we yeah. see this kind of pendulum of change and so that always happens but i kind of think well isn't it time to stop it rocking and to start actually being balanced because actually that's how we can live together. I mean, I have no answers for this whatsoever, literally. I'm the least political person in the world when it comes down to it, and I know that I should educate myself more. But certainly I'm just feeling in that situation at the moment where like, I'm surrounded by good humans. You know, everybody I know really is a good human. That's the majority of people in the world, I think, are good humans. But we're not doing what we should be doing and coming together and concentrating on what difference we can make. And it's almost that thing of, well, learn helplessness well, what difference can I make I'm just one person that no man's an island but it's like no no man is an island but if all of you get together you can create a pretty amazing infrastructure look Absolutely. at what we can create we can do that together and we it's, don't 
even have language barriers anymore. I know. I know. It's, like, it's like we need some huge, like, gun to send <laughs> out a sympathetic and empathetic big burst of rays yeah. that just covers everyone. And then, you know, let's hope the sun can send a solar flare that it does to everyone, you know, and it just makes them all of a sudden just go... What have we been it's doing? It's like my grandma People used to say, what we need is a war. She would say that all the time. And what we need, what this country needs is a war. Because what she was meaning by that was it's a potential where everybody comes together and needs to look out for each other and needs to work together as a team. But the irony is we don't need a war for that. We just need enlightenment and an understanding that it's better, you know? Yeah. yeah. It's like... Um, <coughs> maybe this is our existential crisis. This is, this is what happens to... People Our listeners are with us right now yeah. during an existential crisis. It's time to wake up, everyone. <laughs> but yeah, so that is undoubtedly where I am this week. It's been really serious, hasn't it? No, you know what, though? We're trying to make sense of it. I've mentioned it a couple of times today, but, you know... I like how you've been referencing that yeah. in an attempt to make it so that our listeners are like, what the frig has yeah. happened to these guys? Did Jesus, you... <laughs> just take the foot off the accelerator of nightmarish politics and problems and let's go back to talking about Sauvignon Blanc. <laughs> <laughs> we all know that's what you're thinking and we apologise uh, for it. It's not we have a lot of American fault. listeners there because uh, I think that was, that was American. That oh, no. If I was... <laughs> <laughs> See, you should, if I was gonna you do, just shoot no, horns. If I was in. gonna do an American accent, it would be that accent. Right, the New York one. Well, I don't Boston. know. Well, no, because you I just shoe horn no, some accents no. in. Because I can always, I can always do like a light, a light American accent as well. Mm. So like LA. Like I can do a really, really good Liverpoolian accent. To be honest, that's yeah. a really good one. I wanted to be in Brookside when I was a kid, and I used to practice it, and that's how I do it. And I actually went, and I got a mate there, and she said, "Actually, that's a really good one." You sound, you sound like a pissed scouser. I just sound like a scouser. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Go on then. What's your best accent? I mean, can't believe, can't believe you normally tell me off for shoehorning accents. I feel like we've been so. You've just got, feel like yeah. we've been so Seems, serious. Yeah. That even we've the dogs needed, woken up now. Feel so serious that we needed to lighten it up, and I just needed to do it with an accent. That was yeah. the first thing. I don't know. I can do a Welsh one. I think a little bit. Yeah, that's a good. Not that's too bad. Yeah, you could have been in Gavin and Stacey with that one. I could have. Yeah. I could have. Yeah. I wouldn't say you could have been in Coronation Street. <laughs> oh, very funny. I wouldn't need to do my... Uh, oh, don't even go there with that one before you even start. It's your it. accent. Don't even go there. <laughs> and um, I once had a guy try to teach me an Irish accent and he said I just needed to go turkey tree rabbits. Turkey ah, tree rabbits. Turkey tree. And actually, you know it's right? Because after a while, you can do it. After a while, that's what happens. Is that... Yeah. I can't do that. Right here. Are you going Scottish? Go, I didn't do a bit of a Scottish one. I, I can do a bit of a Scottish one as well. I can do a Scottish. I'm not so bad. I'm I can not do so Glaswe- bad. That's just making, that's that's just a, making that's noise. That's a drunken Glaswegian. It's not. It's just you making random noise. To any Glaswegians <laughs> who go out the weekend and drink, please believe me that I don't believe that that is anything like the way that you sound. No. You <laughs> see, the problem is when I go to do accents, I actually... Um, I get lost in, in between all of them. <laughs> yeah, you just end up sounding like... Yeah. Like, <laughs> quite Indian a yeah. lot of the time. Yeah, actually, yeah. If you do like a... a obviously, when it's Scouse, then you see, because you're talking it. But yeah. uh, if you do uh, Geordie, always turns into Indian. Yeah. yeah Geordie, else. you just swear all the time. You think that if you just say swear words like and go, uh, 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 then it'll be all right. What are you fucking talking about? Like, like, you know what I mean? Now? There you go. That's what you do. <laughs> you got, and you do all that head yeah, stuff. Like, I like if you that. actually were watching this on YouTube, he's doing this weird head stuff like it's attached to the accent anyway <clears throat> well we come to yet another end of what can only be described as a relatively deep slightly angry and bit weird yeah. podcast for today but we did say making sense of it is all about making sense of it and sometimes not being able to make sense of it is what we're making sense about absolutely so keep all of those dark thoughts put them in in the back Room. Get the energy into light. Yeah. Start having light thoughts. And also, let me tell you, <clears throat> I didn't forget urban myths. I had several for today, but it, unfortunately, it looks like we're going to run out of time. So next week, we will <laughs> totally do <forgot>. our <laughs> urban myths. I have at least five, and they're all really, really good. Right, so um, let's hope that Pete does his research for next week's podcast when you join us, because undoubtedly, you won't have left us thinking that we've all gone insane and that what is this podcast become and that left us. You will still be here sticking through with us and enjoying being with us because you realise that you thought your life was a bit mad, but actually now you've listened to us, you know that you're perfectly sane and well-adjusted. Join me <laughs> next week. See you.